I'm happy to be here together with Elisa to present some of the work that the automotive security team at Riscare has been working on the last year. So today we're talking about breaking cars. And obviously we're not talking about breaking cars by throwing a big rock on them. We really talk about breaking cars in a similar fashion attackers would take uh, when they st try to break an embedded system. So one of the first steps you want to achieve in, when you start uh, breaking embedded systems is you want to get a certain understanding of the target. You really need this understanding to a certain degree in order to move to the subsequent steps of identifying vulnerabilities and then exploiting these vulnerabilities. You will all agree with me that in order to get this understanding, it is efficient to have access to the firmware. And that's exactly what the first half of this talk will be about, how to get the firmware out of embedded systems. And please note that whenever I'm talking about embedded systems, I'm also talking about the ECUs that you find in modern cars of today. These little boxes that are present in these cars, they're exactly as an embedded system. It's a single microcontroller typically with functionality that's very specific put in a box. Exactly what an embedded system is about. So nowadays in a modern car there's a multitude of different issues all having their own functionality. And this is a diagram of a modern car that's produced in 2018. And you see that there is a gateway, there's an infotainment system, there's engine controls, there's sensors, there's an instrument cluster, there's all sorts of controllers. And just like embedded systems, these things come really in all forms, shapes, and sizes. And the nice part is that all these ECUs, they're stuck in cars all, everywhere in the world. Anybody has an idea what this picture is about? Well, these are all the cars that were returned after the dieselgate scandal. And they're full with ECUs, and these cars are not being used. And the same holds off for cars that crash, some parts might be broken, but most of the ECUs are still intact. And this means that you can typically buy them very cheaply on your standard sources like eBay. And once you start buying all these issues for a very cheap price compared to the retail value, you end up with lots of issues in your lab, and I don't even know how many issues we have in the lab nowadays. This is Santi, by the way. He uh, pioneered some of the work we talk about today at his internship at Riskier earlier this year. So today we're gonna talk about the instrument cluster. There's really the dashboard in your car that tells you how fast you're going, uh, how much gas you have, if you're going left, if you're going right, everybody knows what this is, right? Well, the primary reason why we went for this target is because it has something to look at. It's one of the few issues that is in your car that actually has a visual impact of the events that are happening inside the device. And who doesn't like blinking lights, right? So we're talking about the first step of performing an exploit. So get into this understanding of a particular target. And we need the firmware in order to do this properly. So how do we get the firmware out of this device? Well, the easiest way would be if there's an official channel. For example, we can extract the firmware from a firmware update, or somebody already did the work for us. So we can just simply download the firmware from the internet. However, for the target that is laying in front of us here, this was not the case. Nobody did the work, and the official channels did not allow us access to the firmware. So with the dashboard in hand, we started looking at what the possibilities were. So there's some interfaces, because obviously the dashboard has to communicate with the rest of the car. There's likely a chip inside, and this chip is obviously running some form of software. But from outside, we have no idea what's going on, so we really need to open the device in order to figure out what's going on there. So once we opened the device, we found indeed a microcontroller. This microcontroller was talking to an EEPROM chip. We extracted the contents using standard tooling. We identified lots of interesting uh, data, but we had no way of interpreting this data because we had no understanding of the device. And certainly the firmware was not stored here. There's the, dash oh, there's the display, and that was the reason in order to uh, buy this dashboard, because it looks cool. Uh, however, there's also no functionality to get to the firmware. More interestingly, we identified several debug interfaces, uh, and these are on the chip, they're implemented there by the manufacturer to allow access to the internals of the device. But the manufacturer of this dashboard, they did their work properly and they protected these debug interfaces, so also these could not be used to get access to the internals of this device. So then we're left with a bunch of inputs and outputs that we do not understand, and the Canvas interface that is used to communicate, communicate to the rest of the car. But we have no idea what's running here. We have no idea what software that's running there. But quickly we realized after analyzing multiple dashboards and multiple other issues that most of them actually um, can talk UDS. And that's a standard protocol uh, that is used by the manufacturers and the garages in order to probe the car 
when something is wrong, or they can identify what part is failing or what part might need replacement. But also, this standard um, describes some mechanisms to get data in and out of the device. For example, this is typically used to perform a firmware upgrade or to set certain configuration options. Um, however, as you can already imagine, some of the functionality is security critical, so they also demand in the specification a uh, security access check that prevents malicious usage or ma malicious access to this functionality. And this standard includes all sorts of other functionality that is interesting, which we will not talk about today. So after analyzing this UDS tag uh, very briefly, we indeed identified the functionality in order to read and write memory. However, we also identified that it was properly protected. And without having the right secrets, we could not access this functionality. So another approach would be to actually perform uh, vulnerability analysis in order to identify a vulnerability and then exploit this. However, without having access to the firmware, hence we're still looking for it, this is not an easy task. And we like easy things, so why would you uh, try to do something difficult if there's easier manners? So let's have a look at the internals of our dashboard again. And there's one interface we did not talk about that we can control, and that's the voltage provided to the chip. So we cut off the original uh, voltage in order to provide our own, and that allows us full control over what kind of voltage signal is provided to the target. And once you're capable of doing this, you can do some very nifty, and that's typically referred to as voltage fault injection or voltage glitching. So how does this work? Well, we all know a chip needs a stable power of a stable clock. We do not tamper with this clock whatsoever in this case. But we provide our own voltage signal. And because of the characteristics of the chip, we need to provide a certain voltage signal that's between certain boundaries. So in this case, it needs to be between 5.5 volts and 1.8 volts. If the voltage is supplied beyond these boundaries, the, in, the behavior of the chip is not guaranteed anymore. So if you're a developer, you do not want to go beyond these boundaries. And because we control this voltage ourselves, we can pull it down, and then the chip will stop. So we have some form of uh, control over the microcontroller, but obviously, stopping the chip is not very useful for us. But if we do this only for a smart moment in time, we can make the chip misbehave because it's only running for a, smart amount of, a, a small amount of time outside of the uh, intended conditions. And this allows us to change it only at that time without affecting its continuation. So really the chip, after the glitch is injected, is still operating as intended, and all the software that's running there is still executing as intended. So in order to inject these glitches, you need tooling. Uh, you need specialized tooling, you need special voltage, volt injection tooling, and nowadays this tooling is easily available. It deserves open source variants, there's commercial tooling, but the key point here is that fault injection attacks are not something anymore that are only performed by specialized labs. It is really something that's available to the masses. And this is also something you see in the uh, public domain where lots and lots of people are talking about now about fault injection, especially if you compare this to five or ten years ago. So the big question always is that I often get asked is, what goes wrong when you're injecting these glitches? And that's not an easy task. I mean, from a functional point of view, you can already state if you provide an unstable voltage signal or an unstable clock signal to the chip, the chip will start misbehaving. And simply said, that's exactly that. But to give you an idea of the things that can go wrong is that the contents that are stored in memory or the contents that are stored in uh, registers, once you start injecting these glitches, at the moment in time when you read these registers or memory, it's not guaranteed anymore that the value that's stored there is correctly transferred over the bus to your processor. And the same thing holds up for the actual data that's retained there. Once you start injecting these glitches, it's not guaranteed that the data that is there will be the intended value. And more importantly, by injecting these glitches, we also have an impact on the processing subsystem responsible for executing your software. We really can change instructions by injecting these glitches. And you can already imagine, if you can change instructions, you will change the software, and including the intended behavior of the software. And bottom line, you really have to keep in mind that whenever somebody is doing fault injection on a target, you cannot trust the expected behavior of this target anymore. Unintended things will happen, some which can be anticipated, but some are more difficult to anticipate. So we can modify instructions, we can modify data. Yes, this also means we can skip instructions. And please keep in mind that whatever we're talking about today is not specific to this dashboard. It's not specific to the software running on this dashboard or the platform on which the software is running. It's really applicable to every 
thing that is not specifically considering fault injection when it's designed. So enough of the theory, let's actually do something useful. So let's start glitching something. So I mentioned the security access check, which is used to protect the reading and writing of memory. Well, typically this is implemented as follows. Uh, the user, the client, the hacker, whoever talks to the ECU, in this case the dashboard, requests access, gets the challenge back, performs a transformation on this challenge using a secret, sends the response back. The ECU checks if the response and the same response is computed on their end is the same, then it proves that both the, uh, the valid user and the ECU have access to the same secret that the attacker should not have. Well, if you remember that we can change instructions, it's probably probably possible to change the intended behavior of that conditional statement by injecting that glitch at that moment in time. And that's exactly what we started doing. However, on this dashboard, we were not successful. And it's not because we could not inject this glitch. We're perfectly fine injecting this glitch. But the thing was, there was a practical hurdle that made this attack not practical for us. Because every three times we send the wrong uh, response, because we do not have access to the secret, a 10 minute delay was set until we could do three responses again. And you will see later, uh, during the demonstration, that it's really needed to send a lot of experiments to the target in order to find the right shape of the glitch, in order to find that successful glitch. So sometimes you just have to move on. Remember, we're trying to find something easy. We don't want to overcomplicate these things. We just want the firmware. So at the end of the day, we want the firmware by reading out some memory. So the functionality that's implemented in the UDS software is the read memory by address command. And we can actually issue this command without being authenticated through the security access check. So there is something in the issue that verifies if we're already authenticated or not. And exactly that check is exactly the same as where the response was being verified. So if we inject that glitch at that moment in time, we will actually be capable of running this command without having access to the secrets used to authenticate yourself to the target. And the best thing here is there's no 10 minute de delay. We can issue this command with the wrong response as many times as we want. We're only limited by the communication speed towards the target. So we started doing this and we were successful on this dashboard. We actually did the same attack where the read by memory by address command is implemented on multiple dashboards on different issues. All of them designed around different microcontrollers showing that this attack is really generic. And depending on the target, because we were still bound by the restrictions in the software, some of the targets let us to extract 40 bytes at a time, some allowed us to get 100 bytes at a time, some allowed us to get 500 bytes at a time, and also because these microcontrollers were different, the internal memories were different as well. So some of them had 500 kilobytes memory, the others had 4 megabytes. And you can already imagine that if you consider the fact that the amount of bytes you can extract, the amount of uh, uh, su uh, the success rate of the glitches and the internal memory size, it changes a little bit how much time it takes to get the internal memories out. However, we were successful on all targets where this particular command was implemented. So enough talking, let's actually show you something. Um, we're not changing to the other laptop yet. First I would like to walk you through the uh, setup that we actually have laying in front of us. So we have a laptop, so a basic computer, and it communicates to our FBA-based glitcher. And this glitcher has two responsibilities. It needs to inject the glitch, so it provides an arbitrary voltage signal to the target in which it can inject this glitch, and it needs to time this. We'll talk about that later. And there's a reset signal. So, so like I said, when you start injecting these glitches, unintended things will happen, and sometimes the chip will get stuck. And in that case, you need to reset the chip to a known state in order to continue your experiments again. And then also, because we uh, communicate to the dashboard using Canvas interface, we need to be able to speak CAN. So we have our own uh, Canvas interface, which is the Huracan, which implements additional functionality. And in this case, we only use one specific thing here, is that it's capable of setting a trigger signal that allows us to time the glitch at a specific moment in time, at the moment it sends the command. So at the moment it sends the wrong response. We will talk about this a little bit more. And this is the actual command that we're sending. So we're trying to read from an actual target 40 hex bytes from address zero. And if you get these bytes out, it's a problem because it should not be possible to read this particular address. And these are the first 64 bytes um, of uh, the firmware that we're interested in. 
So everybody that does some hardware hacking, you know that once you start plugging things together, you have cables going everywhere. And obviously, this is the exact same setup that we're laying in front of you. Obviously, it's not possible to take this setup in the plane and guarantee that it's gonna work here live on stage in Vegas, right? So we had to do something in order to pack this together, in order that it could fit uh, in a luggage, put it in check-in luggage, and open it up here in Vegas again in order for the setup to work. And this is exactly what we have laying in front of us here. Nothing is different. Before we switch to the other laptop to show the demo, I want to walk you through the uh, oscilloscope window you're going to see. So at the green signal, the one here on top, uh, that's the voltage supplied to the target. And the little dip you see there, that's labeled glitch, that's the actual glitch we're injecting into this voltage signal in order to make the chip do something else. The red signal, that is the command being sent towards the target, and response is the response coming back. It's embedded in the same signal because the COM bus interface is a bus. So everything goes over the same signal. And the third one, the blue one, is the trigger. So this is the signal that is set just before the command is being sent out, as you can see. The signal goes up just before. And this signal is taken in by the FBA-based glitcher in order to time the, the glitch. And the timing of this glitch is actually set by the glitch delay. So that is the time between the trigger and the moment the glitch is injected. And then there's two other parameters you need to play with, and they have an impact on the shape of the glitch. So uh, how the uh, glitch is observed by the target. And that is the glitch width, so that's the, the what is it called here, the glitch duration. So that is the width of the pulse that goes down. And there's the glitch voltage, and that's really the amplitude uh, towards the dip is being made in the uh, voltage signal. One thing that the glitch duration and the glitch voltage uh, have in common is that they have formed some form of relationship, because they define the shape of this glitch. So if you glitch too strong, so the combination between the glitch voltage and the glitch duration is too strong, then the target is not capable of continuing anymore. And we want that, right? We want to send the response, inject the glitch, but also get the data from the firmware back. So here on the top left, you see all the combinations where the glitch was too strong, the yellow area. On the bottom right, you see the green area, and these are all the glitches where the combination is too weak, so there's no impact on the target whatsoever. And between those two areas, you see something interesting. You see all these red dots. And these are actually all successful glitches where we extracted 40 hex bytes from the internal firmware of this device. So in order to increase the success rate, which is important because we need a lot of glitches in order to get four megabytes of internal memory out, we can focus on the parameter space where these red dots appear. And this increases the success rate, and it also allows us to actually do this here live on stage. If you could not increase the success rate, it would not be possible. Can we switch to the other laptop? So what you see here on the left side is the exact same picture from the oscilloscope that you show, saw before. There's the voltage, there's the communication, there's the trigger. And on the right side, you actually see the communication towards our FBA-based glitcher. So on the first column, you see a color that represents exactly the same as the plot. Uh, green for too weak, yellow for too strong, red for successful glitch. And then we see that since we are here in this room, we performed roughly 3,000 experiments. We deviate the glitch delay, which is a nanosecond, a little bit. We fix the glitch duration, because there's this relationship between the glitch duration and the glitch voltage. We randomize the glitch voltage a little bit, because one thing to realize is that the parameters of your glitch, they're also affected by the ambient temperature. So the temperature in the Netherlands, where we're from, is different than in this casino here in Vegas, where the air conditioning is brutal. But um, if something would go wrong, we could change the parameters here, we're not going to do that. But more importantly, for the people that uh, know UDS, what we see here in the data column is actually the response of the target. So the first byte is, oh, I'm going to interrupt myself, this is actually a successful glitch. These are the 40 bytes from the internal firmware that is laying here in front of me, that should not come out. Here live on stage in Vegas, it's pretty cool. But what you can see here in the uh, data here is that 7F is error code, 23 means we are uh, sending the read memory by address, 33 means you're not authenticated. Well, that's all as expected. Well, because this is scrolling through, we save one of the results. Note, this is the exact same experiment we started today. So this successful result is also obtained here live on stage. So what you can see here is uh, the 63. That means this is the correct return code. And the rest of these bytes are actually the 40x byte that we're interested in. 
And typically what's stored there are the reset vector and the exception vectors. And for the people that are good with pattern recognition, you see a lot of the same bytes going on. So probably it's the correct data. So what I'm interested in is how many glitches did we get since the beginning? And this is the tool to plot our experiments. So this is the same that we use for uh, plotting the uh, plot I showed you earlier. And you see by the red diamonds that we did not get too many glitches, but at least we got some. And this really shows that fault injection is not too difficult. You can do it here live on stage on a real car or on a real target from a modern car that's being produced uh, recently. Can we back to, go back to the other laptop? So you probably already noticed uh, and I already said it, there's not a 100% success rate. And you would like to build up to uh, as close as you can get to this 100% success rate, especially when you need thousands of successful glitches in order to get the internal firmware out. Well, you probably already saw it in the oscilloscope window is that there's something interesting going on. The reference point that we use to glitch is at the same moment in time. The command we send out is at the same moment in time, but the response that comes back from the target is not always at the same moment in time. And this is because our reference point is decoupled from the moment we want to glitch, from the event we want to glitch. It's not coupled to the authentication check. So in order to increase the success rate significantly, we need a way to couple the reference point to the authentication check. And this is something that's certainly possible. It increases the complexity of the setup, and this is really something that's for another day. So after having enough successful glitches, we got the firmware out. But the firmware, at the end of the day, there might be some strings in there, but this is just a binary blob. What are we going to do with this firmware? And this is exactly where Alisa comes into play. So hi. So this is basically the story so far. We have a pile of firmware. It's a huge binary blob, and we want to do something with it. The idea was understanding. So just kind of to go back to the high-level plan here, we wanted to get the firmware. It was a great success. We did it here on stage. There were glitches. And the next step, I hope you can guess, is to do some kind of reverse engineering. But the reverse engineering, of course, isn't the goal here. The goal is to obtain this understanding that we had in the first place. And why do we want this understanding? Well, different people might have different goals. You might want to do some chip tuning on your engine. You might want some kind of secrets, maybe to make aftermarket tools. You might want to actually find some vulnerabilities, probably very popular here. So it should be easy, right? We have this firmware blob. We can do some kind of static analysis, and everything will be clear. And kind of the typical way this works is you have some kind of operating system code, maybe Linux, VxWorks, QNX, and you have some kind of ECU-specific code, maybe something to drive your display to handle inputs, maybe an application on your file system, and you can simply reverse engineer this application. Of course, in the automotive world, for these ECUs, for many ECUs, this is not how it works. What actually happens is you get a blob, and OK, you might say, OK, but there's still going to be something like maybe a real-time operating system, but it's still kind of separate, and you're going to have some custom code. One of the big problems is this is not quite how it works. What actually happens is you have a huge amount of generated code. So you have some kind of configuration. It might differ per market. It might differ per brand of the car, per um, model of the car. And you also have these models, which are defined at a very high level using something like Simulink. And this all generates generated code, which goes into your firmware blob. Worse, the parts of your operating system code are also generated from this system. So you might say, OK, we can just kind of match these operating system functions. But often, these actually look very, very different. So that means we end up with kind of incomprehensible blobs. This is a screenshot from Ida Pro's graph tool. And as you can guess by the fact I'm saying Ida Pro, the good news is the firmware we're going to be looking at which is the firmware running on this instrument cluster we've been glitching right in front of us, is supported by popular static analysis tools. I must say at this point, we're kind of trying to keep this anonymous. Many of you can probably kind of guess what's going on, but we don't want to pick on a specific manufacturer or a specific processor. As Neek said, this is a very generic problem, and so we're just going to leave the architecture anonymous. And the fun thing is we chose an interesting target that is not actually that well supported by reverse engineering tools. But that's fine. You can patch these up. That's a, a known problem. Kind of a worse problem is we talked, OK, this is very com complex. Static analysis is going to be a pain. 
but dynamic analysis should come to our rescue and let us get understanding quickly. Of course, this architecture is also not supported by any standard dynamic analysis tools. So if you don't have any tools, then what you do as a reverse engineer, you make some tools. So I'm going to quickly go through how we wrote an emulator and let us do dynamic analysis on this firmware. So we go back to our kind of initial view. We open up the instrument cluster and what kind of things are in there? What are we going to need in our emulator in order to actually behave the same as the instrument cluster here? Well, we have a microcontroller, so we're going to need to emulate this instruction set. It's not supported by QEMU and so forth, but sure. We're also going to need all these peripherals. We're going to need timers, interrupts, all kinds of this boring stuff. But we also have this EEPROM and display. That's fine. We can emulate those too. But then they're connected by I2C. We're going to need I2C. We're going to need IO. We're going to need CAN. OK, so let's actually look. How painful is this to do? We can emulate the CPU architecture itself. It's just a lot of reading data sheets. It's boring, but you can do it. It's a good opportunity uh, to uh, take advantage if you've once ever wanted to write a Game Boy emulator. That kind of thing is really good experience for this kind of thing. But then the complicated part is all these peripherals. The good news is, again, we're not going for perfection. All we need is to get the firmware running in the correct way. And it turns out you can actually stop out a lot of these peripherals. Kind of ECUs are often very concerned about their power supply and their clocks. There's dedicated hardware in these chips for monitoring these things. But we don't really care. We can just lie to the firmware and say everything is absolutely fine. Sometimes we just don't implement these peripherals. That means it's not actually as much work as it seems. So how painful is it to actually do this? Well, I wrote before Christmas last year an emulator for this target. And it was kind of working in about a week of work. It was a sleepless work. My family were away. And uh, of course, I decide to spend my free time writing a crazy emulator for this thing. And I have had a chance doing this before. But still, it's something that's fun to do. And I'm sure many of you can, can do this. And it's fun to try, at least for something like the Game Boy. And uh, how much code in it? You can guess if I did it in a week, it's not that much code. It's about 3,000 lines of code in the end, not including some of the neat tools that we're going to show in a moment. But this was enough to make it work. So this is surprisingly practical. A lot of people say, no way, this is way too complicated. But you can certainly get this working relatively efficiently. So why did we do it in the first place? Well, we're going for understanding, right? And we got a bit distracted here. Suddenly we have an emulator. It's a week of work. Why would you do this? Well, obviously, it lets us debug things. Let's you single step through the code, which gives you a reasonable idea of what's going on, set breakpoints. It also um, allows you to hook up a real CAN network. You can hook this emulator up to socket CAN on Linux. That means you can use standard CAN penetration testing tools. But also, you can hook it up to your actual car, which you took your instrument cluster from, or simply other ECUs from the car. And that lets you have a much uh, relatively real environment. And you don't have to go kind of trying to work out which CAN messages you have to play. But it also means that you can play some neat dynamic analysis tricks. These are relatively standard, but I'm going to quickly go through the tricks that we found useful here. The first one of which is execution tracing. So this is a screenshot from IDA Pro. I've named things nicely here. This is the function responsible for doing the checksums on some of the content of the EEPROM in this device. But of course, if you don't have names for this, you just have this huge blob of firmware, how on earth are you meant to go know what's going on? Well, the first trick, first trick is to see which code is actually being executed. Because I, we know from experience, one of my colleagues tried just doing the traditional static analysis approach on this firmware. It turns out if you start at the start and just kind of look at the functions that look likely to be executed, you will find a UDS implementation in there somewhere. But it's the wrong UDS implementation. There's actually two UDS implementations on this thing, and only one of them is used during normal runtime. So you really want to know what code is actually being used. But that's fine. You can just have a bunch of candidate instructions in your static analysis tool, like IDA, which might get executed. You run it in the emulator, and now you know which instructions did get executed. And then you can just add color coding to your static analysis tool. And this makes things much easier. But the reason I picked the EEPROM checksum example here is what happens if we run the emulator again, but we flip some bits in the EEPROM? What happens? Well, suddenly a different path gets executed. And this is quite a neat trick that once you have some kind of dynamic analysis tooling, it really lets you see, oh ho, we changed this input or we changed this state, and suddenly this code is executed. That must be your error path, or that must be whatever's responsible for handling this code. There's also something called taint analysis, which we use very useful. 
So the idea is that you have some kind of input to your program. In this case, we're going to pick a can message, which you'll see why in a moment. And the idea is that you what's called taint this can message. You give it some kind of color. And then when the firmware reads from this peripheral, reads this can message, and writes it to memory, which is on the left side of the screen here, then you propagate the taint. So you also kind of keep track of this. And you can do that because you have an emulator. There are also tools like Avatar 2, which do this for more standard architectures. And again, you can propagate this taint. So if you copy from one location in memory to another or between registers, then you also propagate the taint. And eventually, when you do something that affects control flow with this data, then you can say, aha, this comparison depends on the input. And so why is this useful? Well, let's go all the way back to this annoying security access check that flummoxed us a bit earlier. We have this response, so it's a challenge response mechanism. So we send some random response to the emulator in response to the security access check, and we propagate this taint. And then, at some point, the emulator is going to execute a comparison, which checks, is this the correct response? And then, aha. So what we've actually done is we found where this comparison is, which means we found the code that's responsible for this. And it turns out you could just repeat this. Once you have an emulator working, you can take a bunch of different firmwares, and you can simply find these comparisons and find where is this security access function, and certainly you can calculate your own responses. I'm going to show you a quick demo of another um, way in which having an emulator really helps you understand these things. But first, I'm just going to give you kind of a very a uh, pretty incorrect viewpoint of a high level of how this automotive software works, at least on this instrument cluster. So I kind of at a global view, you have some kind of software components, which we don't care about. Inside these software components, you have different tasks. So the real-time operating system is going to be scheduling these different tasks with different priorities. And so if you have a higher priority task, for example, on the dashboard, some of your warning lights are much more important than, say, something repeating your car radio uh, names. And then inside that, you have these things called runnables, which are basically individual pieces of code responsible kind of for one action. And you also have communication between them. So you have an arrow coming in on the left. That might be an incoming security access message. The first runnable might be responsible for handling UDS. And then it might wake up another runnable that's responsible for actually handling the specific UDS message you responded with. So this is uh, actually the emulator live in action. And this is a visualization view that kind of lets you see on a timeline basis what's going on. So the further to the right you go has increased time. And we're running this in real time. So I'm going to filter the uh, events a little. So every row is a different event. Uh, for example, at the top here, you have can messages. You have interrupt handlers. And below here, you actually have tasks. And then you have some individual runnables. So if I pause the simulation a moment and go back to the start of the execution, then you can see that at the start of the execution, we have a timer starting up really early, an EEPROM. We have one task, which is very suspiciously firing basically when the EEPROM interrupts are happening, when there's something being read from the EEPROM. And then you have these runnables, which are also happening at the same time. And we can look at this and actually say, aha, these are responsible for doing this. Of course, you need to know where the tasks and runnables are, but you can find those surprisingly easy once you know what you're looking for. So to give you another example, we discussed earlier about uh, the, this jitter that we saw when sending a security access message. And if we do the same in the emulator, so this line here, that represents incoming CAN messages. And this line here at the top, that's the outgoing CAN message, which responds to the read memory by address, which was giving us all this jitter. So if I hold down a key on my keyboard, this kind of repeatedly sends these messages, you're, seeing, you're actually seeing a lot of jitter there. And the reason why can be seen here. So what's happened here is we've received a CAN message, but at the time, there's a task running. And that task happens to be higher priority than the task that's responsible for handling our UDS messages. And that means that the response simply gets delayed until that task is finished, and the tasks and the runnables responsible for handling the read memory by address are handled. And this means that it's basically entirely dependent on the internal task state of this thing, what's happening when interrupts are running, exactly when the response is sent. And that means the jitter is maybe inevitable. And you can do a few cool things with this. So uh, I'm going to bring up the dashboard here. We're going to leave it running. And you can see there's no left indicator light showing on the dashboard here. What I can do is I can switch 
to a Linux terminal and use a standard socket can tool to send a message here which should turn on the left indicator. And if I do that, then the left indicator does turn on. It's a silly example, but this is fun to set up. We don't actually do this in practice, setting up fake dashboards to kind of know what's going on. But I give you an idea, you can really use standardized tooling here. So just to kind of wrap up what we've seen so far, we've shown your hardware is gonna betray you. It's basically the message here. Fault injection lets attackers really pull the ground out from under your software. So to emulating a dashboard, it's not too tricky. It's something you can actually do. It works for many ECUs and many embedded systems. And we know the fault injection attacks on UDS, such as the one we described, they're pretty cool. But the thing is, if you have an ECU, if you need to get the firmware out of an ECU or an embedded system, how many of you are gonna look back to this black hat talk and go, I know, I learned about this really cool attack. I can replicate that, that sounds efficient and easy. Just uh, any hands? I'm not seeing a lot of support here. And uh, it's not an efficient attack. It's crazily overcomplicated. I mean, it's nice, it works, it was really neat work, but it turns out actually there are much easier ways to get firmware out of these things. So if we go back to kind of our high level view, let's go back to our assumptions. One of the things we kind of dismissed at the start was this debug port, because maybe it's locked down, maybe there's a password, but there is almost certainly gonna be some kind of debug interface on this thing. And the bad news is generally, this debug interface protection is implemented in software, in some kind of boot one. And I hope you've learned your hardware's gonna betray you if you have software, we can change the software from underneath you. We installed a glitch here, I insert a glitch here, and the debug port will open. And what's amazing about this is you only have to be successful once for this to work. You just open this debug interface once and you can pull all of the firmware out. And this trick also works on pretty much uh, well, many of the ECUs that we've looked at. What else can we do here? Well, we saw all these cables and stuff. This is very fiddly. But how about instead of heading, attacking the voltage, we just head straight for the MCU. So this is uh, an electromagnetic uh, fault injection probe. So this sends basically electromagnetic pulses from a distance. You usually have it somewhat closer to the chip for it to work but basically it generates faults using electromagnetic pulses. And again, there are commercial tools available for this. There's Chip Shouter, which I hear will be available any day now, and we're looking forward to it. There's also commercial whisker tools, and there's open source tools for those of you who are even crazier. And again, these tools, they're really available to the masses. So this is something that people are actually doing, and it's something you can actually do. It may be uh, more expensive to get started on, but it does mean you don't have to worry about all these cables. So just to kind of hammer this point home a bit, it's universal. We're not picking on one device or one ECU. It works on pretty much everything, all CPUs, all microcontrollers, and it works on all software. So it works on this ECU firmware, but you can also play these games on Linux, and Nika and other colleagues have previously presented work on how to do this. The question is, what can we do about this? So if you have an ECU or you have an embedded device and you want to defend against the attackers who are gonna be using these fault injection techniques, what can you do? So we're gonna go over kind of three broad categories here. The first one is you can do something about the hardware. So that's, I think, a lot of people's natural response. The hardware's betraying you, but why on earth is it doing that? Can't we do something about this? So one thing you can do is try and preserve the integrity of your system. Try and stop it from betraying you here. So you can try and add some kind of priority checks to memory. Might also help defend against row hammer and these kind of attacks. Or you can use some kind of mechanism such as running the same code on two processors to make sure your code is being executed and you're not mutating or skipping instructions. At least in the automotive industry, the bad news is that these are generally implemented for safety purposes. And two of my other colleagues, Nielsen Romero, have previously done research on how it turns out these safety mechanisms don't actually work for security. Security and when attackers are deliberately doing fault injection are a very different thing. And just to kind of uh, remind you, don't forget about the debug interfaces. They can be a real problem. They leave a real gap in your defense model. It doesn't matter how much you secure your software if an attacker can just use the debug interface and break all your security. What else can you do? Well, we mentioned software on this device. So what can you do about this? There's an awful lot of things you can do here. There are papers about this, you can just go and Google this, but just to give you kind of two broad ideas, you know that things are kind of gonna go wrong. So how about you add redundancy? 
So for example, if you're going to check whether the user is authenticated before UDS read, by, read memory by address succeeds, how about you do that check twice to so make sure that you can be successful? In the automotive industry, this is something called software lockstep, where in a more software-based manner, for example, you might run a runnable twice or slightly different versions of runnables twice and compare the output. But these are, they might help, but they're definitely not silver bullets. The other thing you can do, remember it's just, well, you just assume there's going to be an attacker, they're going to default ejection, you can make their life harder. So you can add random delays. You saw that jitter from earlier, which um, reduces our success rate. If you deliberately add random delays everywhere so that we can't synchronize to any trigger at all, then that means that these kind of fault injection campaigns do take more time. And you can also do some kind of control flow integrity. For example, you can have a counter and make sure that the counter has been incremented the correct number of times by each bit of the code. But you can read more about this kind of thing online. So we looked at hardware, we looked at software, what else can you do? Well, you can actually improve your design in the first place. So one problem here for this security access check, we just pulled out the firmware or a lot of these ECUs, and you just look at the firmware and the code is right there to calculate these UDS responses. One thing you can do is instead of putting the keys the secrets that you need to calculate these responses in software. Instead, you put them in, in your processor itself into some kind of fuses, and then you use some kind of hardened cryptographic engine available in many, many modern automotive ECUs. And, um, and you simply don't expose the keys to the software. So if an attacker obtains the firmware, that still doesn't let them calculate the responses themselves. Of course, a much better idea is simply use asymmetric cryptography. If you only have a public key, on your ECU, then it's not going to matter how many nifty attacks an attacker can pull on this, they're still not going to manage to get the private key from your data center and, um, and manage to calculate these things itself. But of course, what's most important is combine all of those techniques. You should use a hardened microprocessor. Don't just use something that uh, you're hoping is going to be kind of okay. Get something that actually been tested or tested yourself. Harden your software, or at least harden the important parts of your software. Trying to harden everything is uh, just not really viable, at least at the moment. And please bear this in mind when you're making your design. So the key takeaways I hope you'll take away from this report is of course your hardware is going to betray you and that it doesn't matter if you fix all the vulnerabilities in your software, which you won't, that still doesn't mean that your device is going to be secure. I hope you take away that it's not that hard as you thought. I promise you it's not as hard as you thought to write these kind of fun emulators. You do have to get some experience in this, but if nothing else, go and write one for fun. And of course, your firmware is going to be extracted. I'm emphasizing don't put your secrets in your firmware, but of course the reason for this is that an attacker will obtain your firmware. Whether, as we said in the start, maybe for some upgrade process, maybe by leaks of some kind, or any of the other mechanisms we talked about. So I'd like to thank the colleagues who worked on this. Uh, this is uh, on the left side, Eloy, who was uh, one of my colleagues, a brilliant reverse engineer, who really did this trick, start doing static analysis, starting at the start of the firmware, just trying to work out what when it doesn't work. I mean, uh, I love static analysis, but it's a terrible idea for uh, trying to analyze this kind of firmware. Santi, who you saw earlier, who was responsible um, for doing some of the FI setups on this dashboard, certainly, and Mimo and Neos, who did some other work. You can find um, their papers linked from the slides um, or on the Whisker website. So uh, this uh, work was done at Whisker, as Nick said. Nick is uh, he's shy, but he's uh, head of the automotive uh, team at Whisker, so he knows all about this. Don't listen to him. Oh, we realized there was something called UDS. This is all lies. Um, and as of the 1st of August, uh, I'm a PhD student at VUSEC, so uh, I leave uh, Whisker behind. So uh, thanks very much, and I hope you have questions. <laughs> Nicely done.
It's for me hard to see if anybody has questions, but I don't think I see anybody. Ah, there's one. I just had one question. Uh, some of the processors that I've been involved with have glitch detection, or at least it's supposed to be a glitch detector. How effective are those at defeating your glitching, power glitching? Yeah, that's, uh, the question is that there's chips out there that have specific countermeasures in there to prevent glitch attacks. Um, these things are always a bit difficult to answer. However, uh, if you look, for example, at smart cards, where glitch attacks uh, actually originated from, because people, I think those were the first targets where people started doing fault injection, and those were also the first targets um, where countermeasures were being implemented. And in order to perform a fault injection attack on such targets, it's not as easy as here. And um, uh, it's my opinion, but uh, I'm quite confident to state that if you want to perform a fault injection attack on such targets, uh, it will become a specialized lab attack. It will not be uh, using the tooling that we have in front of here to fault this fault injection. You really have to resort to more uh, sophisticated fault injection like shooting lasers at the chip, for example, and opening the package. But obviously, as always, it really depends on the effectiveness of the countermeasure. And whatever I'm saying is not guaranteed to be true for all targets. But maybe it's also important to say that these are ECUs. They're in your car, they're often safety critical, and voltage fluctuations are a fact of life in these kind of vehicles. You can't just start shutting down things if you detect voltage glitching, which is one of the ways you can implement these glitch detectors. So you need to actually survive these kind of glitches because they do happen in real life and you can't just stop your car. So safety is a real problem for ECUs in particular here. Thank you. Hi, I, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I, I know you're trying to stay away from any specifics or anything like that, but have, have you ever uh, emulated a, a microprocessor that has a memory management unit, uh, so, uh, sort of, that sort of stuff? Yeah, that's, a, that's a good question because that starts adding the complexity. I can say that the week I coded for this emulator does not involve implementing uh, the memory management in this thing. I think, honestly, for me at least, I have implemented thing, uh, processes with MMUs before, emulators for them, and it's frustrating for me not so much because of the complexity of writing the thing, but it makes it slower. I mean, at some point, the speed of these things really gets annoying. But the good news is, the more complicated your processors get, the more likely it is it might be running something like Linux, QNX, VxWorks, and that's a lot easier to work with without having to resort to this. But so, so if, if, if you did have a, if you did have to do an MMU, you probably are not going to approach it this way. Sorry? If, if, if you do have to emulate an MMU, you're probably not going to approach it this way, is, is that? Uh, no, I think I would still approach it this way, but uh, it's, it makes it more painful. The more complicated your processors get, and I think that's maybe the way a lot of the automotive market is going, but again, for ECUs in particular, you want relatively simple processors if you can get away with it. Okay, all right, thank you. But thanks. Do you release the code for your emulator? Are you you're planning to? It's a good question. I mean, I think definitely not because we want to keep the processor anonymous and I think doing that for the emulator is not a good idea. I'm hoping to at least extract useful things from this um, and, uh, and actually get something open sourced, at least the visualization side, but yeah, I wish I could. So could, uh, in that case, could you elaborate a little bit more on how you approached in writing the emulator? So you took, presumably, you started to off with uh, some existing emulators and, and used that as a pattern or, or? So no, this is entirely from scratch. That's why I'm saying writing a Game Boy emulator. The question is, did I base it on something else? Mm. Um, this is from scratch. But if you want to talk more about this, I'd love to talk more in the wrap-up room, and we can also show you the fault injection setup. Yeah, in the interest of respecting everyone's time, we're going to move questions across the hall to the wrap room. Thank you. Thank you.